As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There's a better way to create a website, a professional, crisp website you'll be proud to publish, and it just takes seconds. This is all thanks to Hostinger's AI website generator. I recently took this for a test drive, even shared this on my YouTube channel. It was mind-blowing. Not just how quick you can build a website, but with the AI, how great it actually can write copy for you. You can use the AI logo maker, plus it got it up in no time, and it looks good. Absolutely mind-blowing. So if you want to build a website, go to Hostinger, because they're a top, highly rated global web hosting platform. And all you have to do to build a website is just answer three questions and let the AI do all the work for you. You can build as many web pages as you need without knowing how to code a single line of anything. They have great support, too. That was one thing that I had a problem with with a with a with another host back in the day. Hostinger has 24-7 support and a library of video guides. And here's the thing. You can do this for less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. That is crazy. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast, you can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name, H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R.com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. Give it a spin. One thing I love to do in my business is to pull back the curtain and to share with you a lot of the behind the scenes and the processes that I work through to accomplish some of the goals. And sometimes it's a win, sometimes it is a fail, but every time it's going to be a lesson for you. And that's why I continue to do what I do and why I continue to experiment and try new things. Now, I've been writing books for a number of years now. Thank you to everybody who has supported my previous book, Will It Fly, and helped it as a self-published book become a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Uh, in case you haven't heard yet, my next book is finally coming out. It's called Superfans, and it comes out in August of this year. So by the time this episode publishes, about a month later, and I wanted to bring in my book writing coach, Azul Tarones, who is very, very vital in the process of writing my previous book, Will It Fly, to talk a lot about the book writing process, yes, but more so how we as thought leaders, that's you, the listener, can implement a book strategy in terms of not just writing a book because you have a message to share. I mean, that's a big part of it, obviously. But how does the book actually play a role in the growth of our business, in our authority, and how it can help us get on stages and get more book proposals and those kinds of things? And I wanted to bring Azul on because he was incredibly important in my book writing journey. And with my new book coming out, I wanted to, to, to just bring people on to share with you behind the scenes how I approach book writing now and Azul's take because he and his partner Steve are now helping thought leaders and world changers create books of their own too. So we're gonna dive right in after the intro. Here we go. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he's co-inventor of the Switch Pod, Pat Flynn. Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. It's your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data, plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. And it works like really fast. In fact, by the time this ad's over, 23 new hires will have been made on Indeed according to Indeed data worldwide. It's the perfect match of speed and quality. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites and... I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit 
to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30-day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. What's up, everybody? Paplin here, and welcome to session 379 of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. My name is Pat Flynn, here to help you make more money, save more time, and help more people, too. And today we're talking books, whether you've already written a book or in the process of writing a book or even just starting to think about writing a book, this is gonna be helpful. We're bringing on my book writing coach, Azul Tarones, who has just an incredible journey. He was a former teacher and even has a TED Talk that has been seen over a million times, which is not related to book writing directly. But he, I mean, there's just so many things to unpack here. I'm really excited. Also, like I said earlier, really excited about my upcoming book, Super Fans, which in my eyes is going to be a, huge benefit to those of you who are just starting out, especially in your business. But even if you have a business that's been running for a while, you know, we're always looking for new strategies, new ways to help grow our business. And in my eyes, I'm putting the foot down. The best way to grow your business is to not focus on new traffic and paying for ads and any of that stuff. It is focusing on the people who are in your brand already, even if it's just one person, and helping that person become a fan. Because when they become a super fan, they start to grow your business for you without you even trying. And that's what's happened with Smart Passive Income over the years. I have the best fans in the world, and my goal is to have you find the best fans in the world for you to help you grow your business in an organic and really, truly a fun way. And so that's what Super Fans is about. So if you wanna get that book and pre-order it and support me now, all you have to do is go to yoursuperfans.com and you can pre-order the book, you can submit your receipt there and we'll hook you up with some bonuses like the audiobook. That's right, I'm actually giving away the audiobook to anybody who pre-orders the book right now before August 13th. So go to yoursuperfans.com, follow the instructions there and you'll get set up and thank you to everybody who has already supported that book. I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes on uh, in August. But for now, we're gonna talk book writing and book publishing and how these books can support us with our goals as business owners to help us not just spread the message, but actually grow our brand and help us land more stages, have us write more books and get more opportunities and help more people. And that's what it's all about. So let's dive right in. Here's Azul Tarones from Born to Write and AuthorsWhoLead.com. Here we go. Azul, welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's just such an honor that you're here today. Pat, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. It's been a long time coming. A lot of people have heard your name before. And for those who haven't, I'd love for you to explain a little bit about who you are, what you do, what your work is, what your superpower is. Uh, I want to dive a little bit into how you got to here because it's been an interesting journey. And more than that, uh, I want to make sure we cover how you were so important and vital to my business and some of the work that you've done with my books because you you help uh, people write books and um, it's just so great what you've been able to do for me and so many other people to help spread their message become more of a leader and an authority in their space and we're going to get into that and make sure you stick around because we're going to get into a lot of important conversations about why a book for your leadership how it can help you in your business how it fits into your business plan and all those great things but man you should have been on way long ago i'm just so thrilled that you're here um what how would you define what you do now when people ask me what I do, I, I say I'm a book whisperer, and they often say, well, what is that? I said, well, I help people 
find the message for their book and make sure it's it's born in the way it's supposed to be so they can build their brand, amplify their business, and make more sales towards their, their life. I love that. The book whisperer. That's cool. <laughs> That's so cool. But you didn't always write books. What were you doing before you, you were writing books and helping other people write books? You know, when we first intersected, I was a school teacher. I spent 24 years as a principal, a teacher, and a university instructor for educators. And I was looking for a way to make a transition. And that's basically how I crossed your path and started reading your blog. Um, really back in 2008 when I started figuring out what is this thing called passive income. And I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. So, And that's how I, I started to follow you and learn from you. And people like you because, you know, I found so much uh, struggle finding someone that I could trust uh, their integrity. And that's the thing that resonated with me, with you. And, um, you know, being a teacher, I, I was capable of learning. I just wanted to learn from the right people. And um, I remember <laughs> specifically that you were having a one day business breakthrough, which is something you did with Chris Ducker, uh, in person live events. And I was following you on social and you posted, I'm having one more of these uh, in person events. You know, I'm not posting anywhere but here. And uh, there's a link, click to buy. And I did it. I, I just, I bought it. I didn't have the money. Uh, and I bought the, the thing and then I read more carefully that uh, you need to show your business, uh, what's your website, what's your model, be ready to sit on the hot seat. And I was like terrified, terrified because I didn't have any of that. And uh, so I knew I had a book idea in me. And I thought, you know what? Um, I'm going to finish this book. I have about 30 days until this one day business breakthrough. And I'm going to write it and post every day to hold myself accountable and finish this book in 30 days and um, showed up the day of the event with the book done. And that's the only thing I had to show up with. And I think that's the thing that sparked everything because people started asking, well, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. I remember that because you were one of the students who we were like, wait, what are you doing here? Not not that like we didn't want you there, but me and Chris were running this workshop called the One Day Business Breakthrough Workshop. 15 to 20 students paid their way to come in here, get in the hot seat, and help them scale their existing business, right? It wasn't it wasn't there for people to like to, to find their niche or figure out how to get started. It was literally, okay, you got your start. Let's scale this thing. Let's break down your existing business and build it back up even better. And you, it, it was your hot seat, and you told us that like, well, you didn't have a business, and even when you signed up, you didn't have anything, but within a month, you wrote this book, and we were we were all blown away. Like, how did you not everybody can do that. Like, how did you do that? We started to ask you a lot of questions, but then we started to ask you things like, well, what, like, what do you want? How do you, how do you want to progress from here? You wrote this book. It's called The Art of Apprenticeship, How to Hack Your Way into Any Industry, Get a Mentor, and Make a Killing Doing What You Love. And it's, it's a beautifully written book. I've, I've done a review on it on my YouTube channel before, and it's available on Kindle and paperback, and I'll uh, link to it in the show notes, of course. But tell me what was going through your head during those moments. You wrote this book. You knew you had it in you. But how did this book end up helping you? And, and how did it help you determine where you wanted to go next? Well, I was blown away by the caliber of people sitting in that group. But all, if you think of all the people there and where they are today, um, you know, it was 2014, I think that was. Yeah. And they're all, they were already pretty much six-figure business owners are on their way. And then so many of them have catapulted. But for me, not knowing what to do, I didn't realize, and you had asked, uh, you, know, you know, what kind of what kind of thing could I do? I thought I'd be writing curriculum for teachers. I had no idea that this would be a struggle, uh, writing a book, getting confidence to do it, and knowing what to say. I just didn't know anything about online business. But I knew a lot about helping writers, about structuring writing, how to find the message, and tuning in because I spent a lot of time listening and a lot mainly because in class, I, I'm a dyslexic person so school was always hard I mean I, th I flunked out of freshman English at UCLA I had to take it again I always struggled to read even at third grade so writing was hard so I, I had something to my advantage which is I was really good at listening for the things that were in between mm -hmm. so I think that's what people started asking me could you help me write my book and I didn't know that would be useful I never even never crossed my mind um, so that, that's the thing that kind of sparked the, the idea of rather than focus on the art of apprenticeship, which was what I was attempting to do. Like I want to follow the people that are doing these things and serve them. And that's what apprenticeship is about, about service. And so many people try to take from someone like, could you mentor me? Could you show me? But 
I thought, wow, if we could just serve the people that we care about, then we could really learn. And I, that's what I was there to do. So I think that's kind of the spark of it for me is like finding that there was a need for people that maybe I could fill. And you definitely uh, had proven that with that book. And then you started to get more people asking you for help with their book, including me. <laughs> this was <laughs> right. this was around the time the sort of origin story of Will It Fly, my, my book that came out uh, in early 2016. And I reached out to Azul and we decided to uh, work together to help me through this book. And it was after a, a trial and failure of trying to get it done myself. I just didn't know how to approach it. Yes, I had already written a book before that called Let Go, but that was more of a memoir. It was more based on just personal story. It wasn't like a, a business teaching type book, an information book like I wanted to create. And actually, it was really not even well-defined at this point. And that was the one f first thing that you helped me with. Take us back to Barnes & Noble and the exercise you ran me through that was really eye-opening for me to help me determine sort of what the book that I was supposed to write was because it was not even – it was definitely not called Will It Fly and it, did, did, diff, it definitely didn't even land on the idea behind Will It Fly, which was to help people validate their business idea yet. When I first started working with you, it was it was really a brainstorming session and, and I'd love for you to tell us kind of how that went down and how even those of us listening at home can do that exercise sort of right after this. Right. Yeah. So really it was about emptying your head because you had so many ideas. I remember we met at Barnes and Noble kind of to be in, to have some inspiration. And then we, we talked about your ideas and I said, why don't you just empty your head like on a piece of paper, like a visual map of what you think this book could be, what it might be. And, um, when we stopped and you said, do oh, I think this is it? And there was every topic that was possibly Pat Flynn could teach, which is podcasting, affiliate marketing, online marketing, uh, business, but growing an audience, all these things. And your vision was you wanted to be an online encyclopedia or an encyclopedia for everything online. And uh, we said, okay, maybe sort of the, the book for dummies in some regards that Pat Flynn's authority would be shared with all this. But as we walked around, I remember asking you, uh, Pat, does, do people read encyclopedias anymore? <laughs> and I remember you going, uh, I don't think so. I'm like, huh. And I think that's the thing is that you got to see the book before it's written. You kind of see what is this? Because if you rush too quickly into it, you, you invest a lot of time and energy and thinking into a book that maybe won't serve you and then ultimately may not serve the audience as you want. So that was a big aha in that, that process of unpacking it before you actually start writing it and dive into an outline I think was important. And, and then watching you apply your own sort of uh, style to it and deciding to use post-its and deciding to color code them and deciding to move things around. I think that was important too if people realize you you can see things visually if you can move them around in ways like using index cards or post-its or I think John Vroman from the Front Row Factor, he used a big whiteboard and people use different ways but the visual way to map out the book was the first place we started. Yeah, and I, and I, you know, after that encyclopedia idea, and you had asked me and challenged me, and that that's what makes you such a great coach. Is I, I've gotten a lot of inspiration on how to coach people from you and the way that you coached me through the book process, because you never ever once said, "Do this," or "I think this is the path that you should go down." You asked me questions the entire time. You never at least, I don't think ever once you told me what to do, but you would ask me questions so I could figure out what I needed to do. And one of those first questions that you asked was, how do you want this book to serve you and your audience? And that was such an important question to ask, and that's something that every sort of soon-to-be author, anyone, anybody writing a book should be able to answer before they even dive into the topic of the book. And so to answer that question back then, I remember, how do I want, this book to serve my audience, I want it to be an answer to some of their biggest problems and their questions. So then it became very clear to me, well, let me figure out what their biggest problems are right now. And that's actually what spurred on a survey that was put uh, in 2014, where I had an a I had asked questions like, what's your number one challenge related to starting a business? And you know, we used some pretty sophisticated software, one called SurveyMonkey that allowed us to have sort of different, if this answer then serve this question next and those kinds of things but but the the most important question was that one for people who were just starting out which is a majority of my audience what are you worried about what are you struggling with what's the big challenge for you and the answer that i got in so many different ways but it all boiled down to the same thing was i just don't 
know what idea to go forward with? How do I know it's the right idea? How do I make sure I don't waste my time and money? That phrasing right there actually became the tagline for the book, how to, how to test your next business idea so you don't waste your time and money. The title came way, 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 way later, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit, but that's how I knew, okay, that's the problem I need to solve, and then I, I envision, thanks to you, when you asked, okay, how do you expect people to react when reading this? How do you want them to behave after they read it? It was like, I want them to have the confidence that the idea they chose is the one that they can be confident that that's gonna work for them. And, 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 and then it was reverse engineering. Okay, when it comes to the content of the book, how do I get them there? I know where they're at, I know where I want them to go, but how do I transform them? And, and, and that was one of the first moments I was introduced to that, to that word, transformation, and that was from you. And we hear that all the time now, and it's just a, it's such a beautiful way to think about anything you produce, how you transform people with it. But I still was struggling with the sort of writing process. So after we determined, okay, this was the topic that I was gonna tackle, this is how it's gonna be used in my business, I wasn't quite so future thinking of, okay, this is how it's going to um, you know, turn into an online course, but I was thinking about it in the way that you had coached me, which was this is how I will be using it to serve my audience. But the writing process was, I mean, do you remember how much I struggled with writing? I mean, we met at the co-working space in San Diego several times and I was just struggling for, okay, I know where I want them to go, but how do I get them there? Can you remember some of the ways that you coached me through that process of determining how to include and what to include in this book so that it actually accomplished the goal? Well, I think one of the things you already mentioned, which was, what is it that I want them to walk away with? And that's the hardest thing about a book is making it so simple that it doesn't get more complicated, even though you might be doing some teaching inside that have lots of parts. This, the message should be, will it fly? Will this be the thing that helps them achieve what they're hoping for. And I remember when we did the read through, we'd ask ourselves the question, is does this help that person? And I remember, I remember distinctly one day we looked at each other and go, this isn't it. Because this doesn't meet that goal. It doesn't get them there. It starts to go too deep. And you know, the manuscript that no one will ever see perhaps uh, that you wrote in the beginning wasn't on 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 par to what you had hoped for. And also, the, the big why that you wanted, you wanted to start being able to create courses of your own because up until then, you hadn't done that. So it was also a big uh, motivation, but also terrifying because you're like, this has to be good or, or, quote, has to be right so that I could grow something on my own. And so all those pressures that we kind of put on ourselves when we're creating something really like art, and I really believe writing is art. So like knowing clearly where you want to go and what's your big why was even on your mind as you were writing the book. And some of the, the adjustments were, were made is to let go of things. Sometimes we create great con content that doesn't serve the purpose of the book. And that was a, a big uh, aha, I think, just owning that. that. That was. I remember writing a few chapters that never ended up in Will It Fly because we had to as uh, who's it, Stephen King? He says, like you know, you got to kill your darlings, and even though it's well written, it may not serve its real purpose in the book. But then you had some great ideas, like hey, maybe that can be a bonus chapter, or maybe that can be a podcast episode. You know, you could talk about those same things. And I've done that, but I never mentioned like, oh, this was actually going to be a chapter in Will It Fly, but it wasn't. I was still able to reuse that content in in different ways. But I remember when I was going through the book writing process, and there were moments where I wanted to give up. Azul, and I was questioning, why am I writing this? And I knew what, what I wanted it to do, but I, I was like, aren't there other ways that I can serve my audience with this information? Aren't there different mechanisms for me to deliver this content that would likely be easier to, for me to create? Why a book? And, and I'd love for you to speak to those who are in the audience thinking about creating something so that they can build their authority, so that they can speak more on stages, so that they can do all these things they wanna do and are not quite sure that a book is the way to go. Why, why, why books? I mean, you, you obviously are all in on books right now, but i just love to know why. Is, well, why, why all in on books specifically? Well, I think that the number one reason is, is that books have you know, hundreds of years of history around what they are. You don't have to explain to a four-year-old or a 104-year-old what a book is. They instantly understand. And because, of, because they were written typically um, and curated by people with knowledge, people have an inherent belief that books are valuable and that people that write them are important. Does it mean there are plenty of bad books? Yeah, it does. But that doesn't uh, take away from the idea of 
uh, so many people try to write books, but so few actually publish them. And even though you may, it may seem like everyone seems like they might write, be writing a book, I think the New York Times in 2008 put out an article that said uh, 81% of Americans has, says they have a book inside of them, but only uh, 1% actually uh, 3% actually ever finish a, a manuscript, which is a very small percentage, yeah, right? Very. And, and you know, because you finished a book and realize, uh Oh, this isn't it. And most people will probably give up, but you just push through. But of those 3%, only 30% of those people who actually finished a manuscript actually ever hit publish. So you really are an elite group of people. If you write a book, um, it would be way different if I went to that one day business breakthrough and said, Hey, I just wrote a 20 blog post, you know, in 30 days, you, I don't think that would have had the same impact no. because per, the perception around books have a much higher value. So it's one way to grow authority and uh, you don't have to package the messaging as much around what a book is. You can focus completely on your message because people, even if they don't read your book, if they're able to talk about it, it gives you authority. Because think of all the books you've purchased that you had good intent to read and you plan to, but you still haven't. But you might even still talk about it because it's in the popular conversation. But those books still have value, even if they don't read all of the content, uh, because of the very nature of it being a book. I have this question, and I think a lot of other people do. If we're if we're writing a book, how do we know? How do we know if it's successful? I think that we all know that most books don't end up on the New York Times bestseller list, and for some people, that's a failure, which is kind of unfortunate because your book can do amazing things even without being on the lists. I was very fortunate, and, and again, I can't thank you enough with Will It Fly, that Will It Fly, uh, after its first week, made the Wall Street Journal bestseller as a self-published book. I did, first of all, I didn't even know that was possible. It was one of the right. happiest moments of my life to, to see that. And, and, and of course, still today, the book is being read. I'm still getting tweets, and, and, and now it's in nine different countries around the world in different languages. It's just continued to go on, and I think that speaks to how much we worked in the beginning but I think different people have different goals, especially leaders who are, who, are, who are striving to serve their audience in different kind of ways, who have different goals. What are some benefits of writing a book beyond the authority? Yes, we get this authority with a book, but what are, what are some specific things that we can look forward to and how, how else might we be able to use a book in our business to help spread our message even more beyond the text? Well, definitely, number one, you know, Amazon being one of the top search engines in the world, it, it makes you more searchable, right? You show up more often when people are searching for their problem, which is usually what they're doing when they're looking for a book is solving their problem. Yeah. Um, that's definitely one. There's multiple ways in which you can deliver a book. You know, you could create an audio book, which more and more people, as the years progresses, are using audiobooks as a means to consume content. So that's another stream of income. Um and they can be, like you said, they can be translated into multiple languages. Even though the market might be saturated in one niche that you're a part of, in other countries, that might be a complete void. So there's so many opportunities. And then, as you know, you could there's course content that can be created. Um, there's opportunity to speak. And I want people to remember, like, I was a school teacher. I was not sure even that I had a business idea. And it wasn't until people like you started saying, I really love help, that I thought, wow. I'm just like all these people in Pat's group. I'm one of them who never made more than $500 online and don't know if this is the right idea and the validation I got that I was on the right track. So it brings people to you in a way um, that establishes you as an authority that have done great things. Like I got invited to speak at a TEDx. Uh, I didn't even have to apply. Um, and that was a huge win because I, the introduction could be made. I want to introduce you to Azul. He's an author. They didn't say how many books did he sell or what's the number of you know clicks on his website. They really wanted to know that he was trustworthy and that that has led to multiple keynote speaks speeches so that that I'm getting paid for. So I think it has a lot of places it can go once it's written, including more books, uh, more opportunities for other things. And now is that something you think about as you are writing a book? Would you recommend that in terms of like – my goal with this book is to be on a TEDx stage and you kind of develop this whole plan or is it, is it something that you kind of just, you write the best that, thing that you can and you put it out there and you kind of cross your fingers and, and hope for the best. How much planning can we actually do for our future with a book in mind? I think if you think of your book as your brand, I, I tell people like, think of this book as your transformation moment. If you think of it as transactional, meaning I know stuff, I'm gonna tell you stuff, 
then it ends up being very superficial and people don't remember it. But if you're curating a real transition, transformation that you're having as an author, like you were at the time, you were transitioning from just a, a, an affiliate marketer to someone who was creating content that people would consume, yep. that's a huge shift for you. And you're thinking differently. And so your journey starts to shift. Um, and not only that, but at, if you're thinking about a book, all a book really is, is a, is a five or seven hour conversation, whatever the length it would take them to read your book. And I say, look, if you're going to have a conversation with somebody, whether it be five minutes in an in a airport lounge or an hour at a dinner, what's the conversation you want to own that you feel like you want to hang on to that you could have in multiple ways in multiple places? That's why creating a speech, the initial idea is very similar because you're curating the idea that you're going to own. And so to validate that, that's the book that I'm launching as well was built on the idea of what was it if it were just a talk? What if what if I validated a book through a talk first to see if it has legs, to see if it has virality or has meaning? And that can be possibly a way you do things, just like you can create a blog post that maybe gets good traction. It could be the potential focus of a book. And I think it's good to test those ideas before you commit because it, once you commit, you have to be all in. A lot of books sell because they're marketed well, not just because they're good or well-written. Yeah, I mean, uh, for sure. And and speaking of, you know, taking a speech as sort of validation and turning it into a book, that's exactly what I did with my next and upcoming book, which is coming out next month. It's called Super Fans, and this is based on a talk that was done in 2015. Actually, it was 2014. It was very popular. It's been asked, uh, I've been asked to do it over and over and over again all around the world. I've performed it in Australia. Uh, I've performed it all around the world. And then it was actually after speaking about super fans in San Diego on social media day, a good friend of mine, Jay Bear, uh, from Convince and Convert came up to me. He was like, Pat, dude, that was so good that like you should turn that into a book. And I never had thought of that. I was like, oh, well, I, I delivered this content in a speech already. It's out there and that's the way people should consume it. But obviously a book can, can be so much more wide reaching and more impactful and authority building and reach people who can't come to your conference. And so I'm just really excited for, uh, that, that you mentioned that because that's the exact same path that I've taken with, with this book. And I know a lot of people who are using even uh, online events to test certain things like webinars and other, other, other things where you're in front of an audience and you can gauge reality actions right away some sometimes people create free ebooks like michael hyatt did with his uh, free ebook which was called living forward and that turned into a best-selling book down the road so there's I, I love that you're speaking on the idea of validation so you're not just creating to create but you're creating because the audience has already spoken up and said they've, they've wanted to learn more uh, uh, about something right and that's and that validation for the book um you know what makes a good teacher great was even no, it was 18 minutes of my life on a stage, it validated how many people all over the world that cared about this topic. So it was able to give proof so that I could commit to it. And it's something I care about. It's something I believe in. So I knew that messaging worked. And if you're not careful, if you just talk about information, it could easily run dry on you. But you, super fan, the qualities that you've held up even since that talk in 2014 exemplify who you are. It continues to be who you are. It's a message that will continually resonate with your followers and for you. So that's an important way to look at books. Like, will I keep wanting to have this conversation or will I only care about it for a little bit? Right. Now, speaking of, of thinking about the future and how a book can play a role in your business uh, as a leader, as, as somebody who's you know trying to monetize and, and all those kinds of things, you know, uh, I remember with Will It Fly, it was a very last minute decision to add the companion course in Will It Fly, and for those of you who haven't read Will It Fly, in the first few pages and throughout the entire book, you'll see call to actions to go to a specific page to get a bonus free companion course, which uh, actually was inspired by a show that I love called The Walking Dead. I don't know if you've, you even know this sort of origin story as well, but I was watching The Walking Dead with my wife. We're pretty big super fans. You'll see it end up in the book, actually. We, we go to the Walking Dead, there's sort of Walker Stalker Con, as it's called, and right. we, we, we don't do cosplay just because the fake blood would not travel very well, but other than that, anyway, uh, we're big fans of the Walking Dead, and before the Walking Dead plays on AMC, 
they go, hey, go to walkingdeadstorysync.com and you can get your side-by-side sort of experience while you watch this to get some behind the scenes and other stuff. It's such a, such a cool experience. So I wanted to create that for Will It Fly. So I set up a teachable course in a day and a half. It was like, it was right before the manuscript was due and we were gonna go to print with it essentially. Um, I set it up and, and got the URL for it and just in a day and a half, I built the course in a way where it was structured uh, lesson by lesson was working in conjunction with the chapters in the book. And so you can go into the companion course and you see the images that were in the book, but they're high res. All the links that were mentioned in each chapter are in each chapter in the course. And then some videos on things that are a little bit more difficult to kind of explain via text. And I can't tell you how many comments I get about that, but more than that, uh, we've ch- I, I recently checked the data. It's, it's 35% of people who read the book get into that course and it's free. But guess what I have now? I have their email address, and I can reach back out to them. And it was actually through the emails that I was sending to them on further help with Will It Fly that inspired me to create my first online course. My first online course was going to be about something else, but this was getting asked about so much because of that direct connection with your with with my readers. Because unless you collect their email, there's really no way to know who's reading your book. They asked me for more information, and that's where Smart from Scratch came from. And that turned into a lot of confidence that allowed me to build Power Up Podcasting and then 123 Affiliate Marketing. And it really was the start of all that. And so, you know, how, how soon, uh, like, how, how soon, is, like, can, can we plan for sort of lead capture like that into our book? Is that something we should think about as we are creating content in the book? Um, because that was truly a last minute thing. And I think it could have been done even better if I thought about it ahead of time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the great thing about, uh, Amazon and uh, books that are delivered, you could put links in there. In fact, in Kindle, you know, they 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 don't prevent you. They they encourage you to put links to capture emails. So that's awesome. They want it to be a great experience for their readers. Uh, so yeah, for sure, capitalize on that. Draw them off of a platform that doesn't let you collect their uh, emails and, and and get them. And especially if it's you know content that really engages them, like that's important. I know even. Uh, our mutual friend, Dana Malstaff, when we were working together on her book, because uh, she actually is one of the people I met at one of the One Day Business Breakthroughs, mm-hmm. and uh, she she wanted to write her book. The thing about that I noticed about her is that she was a content strategist, and, and her I think her brand was called Expand Your Reach, and she had a podcast and this this whole brand, but she got really passionate in the working uh, of during that same visual process where we talked about what is this book you know, that we worked on in that Barnes & Noble. And the thing that I noticed, she had this like a little image or this little thing about a bucket of love. And I said, what is this, Dan? Why why this bucket of love? And we're talking about content strategy. And she had mentioned that she really felt like mothers felt guilty for loving their business as much as their children or family or spouse. Mm -hmm. And they didn't feel comfortable, but she really wanted them to be boss moms about it. And I said, "What what what is that boss mom? And she went on and on. And what what happened was she pivoted and she worked her way into a whole new brand because of the questioning, because of the, the deeper understanding. And Boss Mom, the book that became, became her brand of her podcast, the brand of her blog, and she used it to draw people into her programs as well, just like you did, and um, has been able to grow a huge audience and become a, a strong influencer around women who want to start a business with children at home. Yeah, I mean that's amazing, and I've I've noticed a lot of people who have used their books to create transitions as sort of like an announcement and a way to kind of step into a new thing, and Superfans is doing that for me a little bit, and, and I'm not going to reveal exactly how in the uh, but but you'll hear about it later, but the uh, you know it makes me think of you know Gretchen Rubin. It makes me think of Sally Hogshead, who each have books that then tie into sort of like a quiz that you could take that is their lead magnet. So Sally Hogshead, for example, has a book called Fascinate, where there's specific types of ways that we each as a person can be fascinating to others. And it's important to know that. It's sort of like a, a strength finders test, but like more like, well, what makes you interesting? You have to know that so that you can sort of sort of uh, triple down on that and understand how you can best share your superpowers with others. And it's really cool. I, I remember her speaking at Social Media Marketing World. Uh, I think it was the very first Social Media 
media, media marketing world five years ago, five or six years ago, and, and she spoke and she had, like, she was a great storyteller, but it made me want to get her book. But it also made me interested in this test, and I applied for it, and it's free, but then, like, she started sending me emails and getting me into her ecosystem, and it was a really cool, natural, smart, organic way to sort of bring me into her brand and share these things with me. And it was just, it was just so fascinating. And then there's other books like, Story brand, which comes to mind, which has a very specific framework that then now people can hire a story branded person, sort of certified story brand person to come and quote story brand their own website and business. And that's been really successful. And, you know, there's there's like Strength Finder that has people who specialize in offering Strength Finder tests to others. I mean, these are the, these are books that are obviously the start of something much bigger. H- how do we you know, beyond just writing to write a book, like how, how, like, can you give us some insight on, on how one might be able to think about a book to be used on sort of, on sort of that level? And how do, how do we even begin to start thinking about that? I always tell people it, it comes down to messaging. Like what is, what is it that you're saying that's unique, not original? Cause a lot of people think, well, I have to think of something original. If you get too original, people won't know what you're talking about. It's hard to capture them. So you got to think of what's unique. What's my lens? What's my view? How, is there something that, that kind of irks me in the world, something that that I see in a fresh way that's been there all along. And then when you can captivate them on something simple like that and you want to own that conversation, then you're able to continually drive them to your you as the answer. So Simon Sinek, Sinek comes to mind and the Start With Why being his book, the same thing that drives traffic back to his, his lead magnet and his site is it's not that he was the first one to ask this question, Start With Why. He just owned it. And that's one thing you can do is like, what do I want to own? Where do I, where do I want to build my brand on? What do I want to build my capacity around so that I could be known for this um, in, a, in a long lasting way? And if you can do that in a way that's natural, that fits your personality, your uniqueness, your quality, even if you pivot in your business, will this still resonate with you? Do you still care about this topic enough? And then you're able to think of multiple ways to build uh, engagement, a quiz, a uh, a course. Uh, I know people who give a free download of the, you know, X number of chapters of their audiobook if they want to get a lead magnet, something that simple. Hey, go to here, you get the first five chapters, or go here and get a free interview behind the scenes with the author about the process. Those kinds of things are really valuable because they've grown to trust you in the process of reading your book and they want more. That's true. That's amazing. And you, you, you are now somebody who a lot of uh, my colleagues and friends and other thought leaders go to for help with writing books. What do you think the biggest challenges are for busy thought leaders when it comes to writing books? What, what are some of the big objections or big hardships that, that they're having that you could kind of uh, share with us? Uh, number one, I don't know if I have time. I don't know if I have time to do this. Um, that's one of the biggest ob- objections. And I often tell people, um, that our perception of writing books is a little bit off. We, we think of books as being this really big task when really writing a book is a small task. And, you know, when I asked Chris Gillibeau this in 2013, he's like, well, it's just about writing a thousand words a day, just a word count a day, 500 words a day. It's not about how hard you work or that you have to, you know, sit over a typewriter for days and lock yourself in, in a cabin and that's what it really comes down to. And that's what I use to apply to writing my book is like break it down into small bite-sized pieces. Mm-hmm. And I remember even for you, as far as the objection of time, I asked you, how long does it take you to write a blog post? Because uh, you thought, well, you know what? I'll read, I'll speak the book. I'm a podcaster. I'll speak the book. But that didn't really work for you. It just didn't come out the way you wanted. Yeah. But thinking about it as small bite-sized pieces and saying, I can write a blog post in about an hour and then breaking down that process into smaller steps. So teaching people, number one, that most people think they're writing, right? They say, I'm writing a book or I'm doing some writing. What they really usually mean is I'm researching, I'm thinking, I'm looking at other people's books, I'm reviewing things on Amazon. They're not really writing. And I I tell people, only say you're writing when words leave your, your brain from your fingers onto some page, either written by hand or on a computer. That's when writing. Only count that as writing. And don't count thinking as writing. So that you realize that it doesn't take as long as you think. So that's the number one objection. Like people usually say, I don't have time. And I, I tell people, if you have 20 minutes a day, you can write a book in six months without a problem. It's just about 
understanding the basic principle. And a lot of people listening to this might recall my December or no, November challenge from 2018, NaNoWriMo, which is a big worldwide thing where people challenge themselves. It's just this big worldwide movement that's been around for years. Uh, NaNoWriMo stands for National Novel Writers Month. And I had used that as my sort of challenge and accountability for writing, trying to write a thousand words per day. And I didn't always get a thousand words per day, but I did write every day. And on Instagram and on Twitter, I'd share a little spreadsheet that I added to every single day. And Will It Fly took me overall about 18 to 24 months to finish in terms of just the writing part of it, including scrapping the original manuscript and starting over again and that sort of stuff. The Superfans book took me 45 days. Right. to get to my first draft. And it was because I, I, I definitely took it into day-by-day day chunks. I, yes, had a little bit of an advantage knowing that I've spoken about this topic before, so it was something that I knew a lot about. And, and, and it's a little bit different presenting something and then writing a book about it, but it, it, dif- it definitely did help me. But most of all, it was just just chipping away at it, Azul, and, it, and it, it truly helped me. And of course, I learned from the first go around to find the tool that worked best for me. Everybody, all my friends were using Scrivener for their books, and I, I tried to use it as well. Remember with Will It Fly, and it just was so right. overwhelming. And you were like, Pat, how do you write blog posts? And I was like, well, I write them in Google Docs. And you're like, just write your book in Google Docs and write it you know, uh, as if you're writing a blog post, just one chapter per, uh, per Google uh, Doc. And that is when things started to finally happen. So I did that with super fans right from the get-go, and it was really helpful. So again, thank you for everything that you've done and taught me. And hopefully people are getting inspiration and learning how they might be able to write their books in not so long as they might think time uh, since writing this. So so time is one thing. What, what's another big objection that thought leaders have when it comes to you know writing their books? I don't know if this is, they'll think, how do I know what is the right idea? I have lots of ideas, I have lots of options. How do I find my the right idea? And there's multiple ways to do it. You know, if you're making, you want to make your living as a writer and you want to write multiple books, you really got to think about the overall uh, stamina you need to have to keep writing books in a certain genre. Our friend Steve Scott, you know, he writes in a particular niche and he stays there because it's successful for him. He makes a significant amount of money every month on staying in, in niche. But if you want to write in a, a book that, that helps you grow a brand or launch a personal business in a certain way and grow authority, people often get nervous. How do I pick the right idea? Mm-hmm. And I, I tell people, look, you have to think of this as that, that same thing, a conversation. What will you feel confident about talking with anybody if you sat down with them? What do you feel like you want to own in this conversation? And if you can think of that, that simply and think of well, what makes me unique in this conversation, because you're not the only one who has this you know, niche or this idea, but what will make you unique? What can you stand out? And oftentimes people don't notice their greatness because they live in their body, they live in their soul. They they don't see how great they are. They don't even notice how great their their biggest failures and their lowest lows and their highest highs have to do with who they are. But a lot of people, if they focus on some of those things and brought them into their their message, they could really have a huge impact. So my my you know my wonder when I was writing the book to go to the one day business breakthrough is who am I? What do I have to say? And the truth was, I had a lens of being a teacher. I had a lens of being in a place of observing lots of people and studying things in a way that maybe other people wouldn't have. So I was able to use my thinking to the, my advantage and my perspective. So I think that's one thing. Realize that the way you message a book, finding the idea is important, but there's no wrong choice. They're just the choice you make. You've got to commit. You can't be worried for too long. So we've talked about some of the objections. Can you share some success stories from some of the authors that you've helped in terms of what their book has done for them? Um, obviously with Will It Fly, it's turned into an international red book and that's been really amazing. It's definitely led to more speaking opportunities. It's led to publisher, like as a self-published book, it's led to publishers and agents reaching out to me, which is just kind of, kind of unbelievable. Um, and we're still trying to figure out, you know, our future roadmap in terms of traditional versus self-publishing. We have some podcast episodes coming up that are going to be talking about that specifically. Super fans 
during the launch at least, is going to be self-published still. And again, you'll see that in August. But um, speak to some of the cool things that have happened since some of these uh, these leaders have published their books beyond just like, oh yeah, they made more money with a book. Yeah, I, I think I think about John Vroman because he's just on top of mind because he's just sent me an email um, that he he he's a speaker. He usually speaks in colleges, but he wanted to not travel so much on the road, and he runs a foundation called Front Row. Um, the Front Row Factor, and basically gives people with a life-threatening illness um, an opportunity, a lot like Make-A-Wish, but adults can do it too, to get a, uh, an experience in the front row of their choice. Um, so he wanted to write a book uh, called The Front Row Factor. He wanted to use it to to start to build a, a business around not traveling, but teaching and educating and leading. Um, and so just codifying his message and his journey and the purpose of that book and the stories of people that have experienced this, that book has led to not only, you know, incredible sales and communities and um, getting more gigs outside of the college arena. I think he said someone recently just read his book, loved it and signed him up for $35,000 keynote, which is, that's huge from, from, from his book because they liked his book. So it really allowed him to, to leap into a place of like, he wants to spend more time with his family, commit to uh, being a dad and focus on starting more of that kind of uh, business. So that's one example, you know, and I think others are that people have started to show up. There's one particular author who he came to me from somebody else. um, And he basically wanted to write a memoir, which, you know, those are difficult. They're difficult to sell. They're difficult to to change. So it's got to be a personal journey. And he said, essentially, in the email, here's 128, 178 pages. And he goes, essentially, this was my suicide note, but I didn't go through with it. And I was like blown away that this man would send this to me. But he he was messing up all of his life. He got into army. He got himself a little bit straight, but he was still struggling. He he was trying to pass calculus for the third time when he only finished eighth grade math. And his goal was, as he was writing the book and he was working with me to get it published, was to get to an Ivy League school. He goes, that would be ultimate, man. Some dropout, some guy that's a mess can get out of this army and get somewhere. And uh, that book alone, during the process, he got accepted to Cornell. Um, wow. So just watching him commit to the ending of the book, which is, I, what do I say? I, I'm not dead? I'm like, I don't know. What do you want? He's like, I want to go to Cornell. And that's what he did. He, he went from, you know, it's called um, mental violation going from rock bottom to Ivy League. And so that book served him because he got what he was looking for. He got what he really wanted. And so, you know, if you look beyond even monetization, you could see it really taking you to a new place in life. And definitely that's one of the things that a book can do for you because it gives you clarity. It gives you a sense of focus uh, in your business and your life. That's amazing. And some amazing things have happened in your life since – uh, we last chatted uh, um, or talked about you on the podcast at least. And I know that referencing the TEDx talk that you did, um, how, how many views does it have now, Azul? <laughs> Maybe 1.4 million. 1.4 million. We'll link to that in the show notes. But tell us tell us what that uh, TEDx talk was. And as you said, it's opened up a lot more opportunities for you. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about this upcoming book that you have, which is outside the realm of helping people write books, which you're still doing. Actually, you're, you're going you know, even deeper into that. You and your partner, Steve, uh, are creating workshops and retreats for book writing. And, and I'd love for you to share those things in a minute. But this TEDx talk, what was it about? And uh, how does it tie into the book that you're writing? When's the book coming out? Yeah, so the book, um, the book idea I had for a while, uh, it's called "What Makes a Good Teacher Great." Um, but uh, I had prepared a propo- proposal. Actually, right around the time when you were finishing your book, I was writing this book proposal because I met Dan Roan, who is the uh, the New York Times bestselling author of "Back of the Napkin." He has a couple of New York Times bestselling book, and casually asked me, "Hey, so what are you doing?" And I said, "I'm a teacher, uh, but I'm writing a book." And uh, I just had an idea. I really wasn't necessarily writing it. It was writing in my head kind of thing. And he said, I, he said, well, what is it? I said, well, it's called What Makes a Good Teacher Great. And I said, for 24 years, um, I've asked this question in inner city LA, in urban schools in Texas, and elite schools abroad. And I've collected 26,000 responses to this question in the last 24 years. And he says, that's amazing. He goes, that should be, that's a best-selling book. You should talk to my agent, who's also the agent of Austin Cleon, who wrote Still Like an Artist. And my heart stopped. I was like, 
because I'm looking for validation, but I wasn't ready for that much validation. <laughs> I think I, I think I froze. I think that was it was a blessing and a curse because I freaked out because I didn't really think much of the idea, to be honest. Uh, so I was telling people about this idea. I got a proposal and I sent it off to um, somebody who was helping with the proposal, and he came back and said, "This this this is not very good. It's not very interesting." And my heart was broken. Mm. He goes, but these things, when you talk about these kids and what they say, he goes, that's super interesting. Because I was going on about education, what's wrong, how it can change. He says, that's all good and well. He goes, but these, when you say what kids say to you and what you think of it, he goes, that's valuable. So that's where the, the idea of this talk came from. I go, let me test this out. And I told the, this uh, TEDx organizer of the TEDx of Santo Domingo in Dominican Republic that I had this idea and Charlie Hohen, who's the, uh, introduced me to him. And Charlie Hohen was, I probably best known for being Tim Ferriss's first employee. Uh, basically, made the introduction said, "Hey, Azul has a cool idea. Talk to him about his book. Uh, he's already written a book, but he'd be great." So I pitched this idea just as I told you. He says, "Great. Why don't you come do the talk?" So I did the the talk and prepared it. And the night before. Charlie was helping me with it, and he says, I think you should change it, rearrange it. So I rewrote it the night before. I barely really knew it very well. Um, I, usually, I, mean, I don't prepare a lot, but I really don't usually prepare the night before. Yeah, jeez. Uh, <laughs> I was nervous because this is, you know, one, it's another country. It's a big deal. Um, but the message was there. What I wanted to say showed up that, that about what kids really say and the things that kind of blew my mind about what kids think. And the biggest message was, we're not listening to kids. And if we just listen, we could change the face of education one classroom at a time. Um, and that was really where the book came from. That's where the message on TEDx came from, was that focus, that simple idea of what makes a good teacher great. That's amazing. And so what, when can we expect the book? Because I know we were talking about it years ago and as it was being developed and you were looking for an illustrator and all this stuff. Like how far along is it? When, when, when am I going to see it? August 22nd. Wow. That's what so, so that's pretty close yeah. to when my when my book comes out. So it'll be soon yeah. after. Yeah. So I'm excited and terrified at the same time, just like everyone who shares a book of the world. There's no way getting around that, I think. Oh, dude, I'm su I'm super stoked for you. And 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 really stoked for everybody who's listening to this who has uh been inspired to start thinking about a book for their business, for their authority, for their life. Uh, who has been sort of reignited after perhaps trying to go down that route before. And I'm just uh, excited to see everything that everybody comes up with. I still think books are an amazing tool and amazing way to share a message and to kind of put your foot on the ground. I think that's that's another thing with these books that I'm really excited about is that it's like, you know, part of building a business and building authority is to have a stance on something, to um, you know make decisions and, 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 and put your foot on the ground and say certain things versus just, trying to play in the middle and please everybody. Not to say that you are trying to write a book to stir up anything, but when you have specific goals, when you have specific ways that you teach and specific beliefs, when it's written in a book, it's it's there for people to consume and they can choose whether or not they wanna follow you or not. And as I talk about in my book, Will It Fly? When you have that message, then people start to believe it and they start to see you as a leader they're gonna become super fans and help you build your brand for you. You won't have to work so hard to get new people into your brand when you serve that audience who follows you for you. And it's just really exciting to see and, and I'm excited to hear about the ripple effect of this episode and your book and my book and everybody else's book as well. So, I mean, that's why we're here. And uh, I just wanna thank you again, Azul, for coming on. I'm sorry Steve couldn't be here as well, but if people wanna learn more from you and Steve and how you can help them with their book writing and where to even start, uh, what would you recommend they, they get into right now? Yeah, they come to authorswholead.com. They can learn more about us, about the book writing process, and figure out what uh, message they should share with the world. I really want people to know that anyone can do it, really. Everyone should. And I'm, I, I maybe go against a lot of other teachers of writing. I think everyone should write a book because they can, and they should. And um, the teacher in me wouldn't let anybody not put something out that's worthy, but it also uh, would not keep somebody from writing a book because they have something to say. And I think it's a way to connect. So I really would love to hear more about the, the things that people want to share with the world. Amazing. Thank you. And you have a podcast as well that we could all check out, right? Yeah, it's called Born to Write. It's where we share behind the scenes with authors and their messages from New York Times bestselling authors to self-published and first-time authors. And they can hear what it's like to go through the journey of kind of getting a book on, on the page. 
Awesome. So authorswholead.com and Born to Write on your podcast app right now. Azul, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you so, so much. You're an amazing teacher, coach, and inspiration. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Same here. Thanks, Pat. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Azul Torones. You can find he and Steve's podcast at Born to Write. Just look that up wherever podcasts are available to you. And then also Authors Who Lead. Dot com. If you want all the links and the show notes and the resources mentioned in this episode, all you have to do is go to smartpassiveincome.com slash session 379. One more time, that's smartpassiveincome.com slash session 379. And if you haven't yet done so, please pre-order my upcoming book, Superfans. I'm, I'm promising you it's gonna be incredibly helpful. You're gonna laugh, you're gonna have a good time, and you're gonna learn some stuff and implement some stuff right away too. You'll see that there's exercises that you can actually implement as you are reading the book with you and your business too, no matter how big or small it is. So go to yoursuperfans.com, pre-order it before August 13th, and you can get the audiobook for free. And if you're listening to this after that date, obviously I'd still love your support in uh, checking out the book and you know, all that good stuff. So thank you so much, yoursuperfans.com. And Team Flynn, you're amazing. Thank you so much for the support. I hope you got a lot of value out of this episode. And until the next one, please hit subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, Team Flynn for the win. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Starting a business can feel daunting and confusing, but it doesn't have to be. That's why Terry Rice started the Launch Your Business podcast, another awesome show from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. Each week, Terry shares strategic actions, specific tools, and what he refers to as high-performance mindsets that allow you to thrive under pressure. Recent guests include rapper T.I., Amy Porterfield, and yours truly. And Terry frequently publishes value-packed solo shows too, like this one titled How to Write Proposals That Get Accepted and Don't Take Forever to Write. Great stuff. So make sure you listen in to Launch Your Business right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.